Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's really exciting. I know there's been a little bit of a delay from this. Sometimes you know, things happen. Well, let's kick at this with the anthem. Once we've done the anthem, by that time when the anthem is the idea is that we'd have shared it and invited people, and then I can use my guests and we have a conversation. Let's start. All right, you ready? And make our nation great and strong, both to deep and forever. The cause of freedom and of pride. In the heart, we truly want. to go and i hope that you guys are also ready to go i would allow my guest to introduce himself because i believe people can introduce themselves best so i will introduce myself first and then we will get into the chat obviously if you have any questions do feel free to start putting in the comments and we will pick those up as interview progresses good evening sir uh good evening Amma. how are you I'm very good, thank you. You? I'm I'm very well. Excellent, excellent. Good to be here, and uh, thanks for doing this. By the way, um, I apologize. Um, we had a bit of problem with power, so we had to run around to still get on the show. So thank you for the patience, and my sincerest apologies to all those who were waiting. Grateful you made it happen. That's amazing. We have to. So you have, people don't quite know you, and I don't want to do the introduction injustice. So <laughs> I want to take a minute, yes, of telling my audience who've not come across you before, how you want us to know you, the way you want to be introduced to them. Right. Um, my name is uh, Marik Kofi Gan. Um, those who cannot call all that call me Kofi Ghana. So I'm happy to be called Kofi Ghana if that works. But yeah, it seems to be quite popular with the old folks calling Kofi Ghana. So yeah, feel free to call me that. Um, but my name is uh, Marik uh, Kofi Ghana. I prefer normally to be called Kofi. Um, shall I just go on and, and tell everybody about who I am, where I come from and all that? Please, please tell us about you. Excellent. Um, so, um, you know my name. I was born in uh, Keta, a small 
town in the Volta region. I'm not quite a small town. It used to not be a small town. Uh, but I was born in Kitan, the Volta region. So I grew up between the lagoon and the sea as a fisherman, uh, courtesy of my grandfather. Um, sold foes in the Kitan market with my grandma. Um, so that's a bit of my upbringing. Um, I went to school there in primary school and then uh, left to join my father in Liberia and a few other places and then ended up in Nigeria um, and then came back home to start my secondary school um, where, I, where I was shipped back to Keta. So I went to Keta Secondary School. So I'm a Jolalian, which I'm very proud of, uh, extremely proud of. Yeah. Um, so after secondary school, school six form O level and six form in the same school i uh, i got admission to read chemistry at legon and decided you know um you know i i was i wasn't doing well with the sciences um so i decided to go back to my first love which was accounting so i ended up a chartered certified accountant so i'm a chartered certified accountant um i've practiced in ghana uh, for quite a while uh, did quite a lot of work uh, all through ghana and then went off to the UK um, and started working in international development. So I've, I've been to a few places. Uh, I've worked in the Commonwealth of Nations Secretariat. I've worked with the Christian Aid. I've worked with uh, uh, International Alert uh, and, and, and then ended up with Crown Agents. I think Crown Agents UK was the biggest place uh, of all of them. Um, which took me to about 20 countries, most of them in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, so I, so that's the diversity of my background. So I've practiced accounting, practice auditing, practice international development, uh, management and everything else in between. Um, and, um, and most people say, well, you haven't been in Ghana. That's not true. I've been in Ghana for the most part of that. Um, the 20 countries I, I had to be assigned to almost always had Ghana in, in it. So we actually did even have an office here. So I've always been in Ghana. I've always been part of everything happening here. But anyway, I finally came back about four years ago, uh, three, four years ago, uh, about four years ago. And um, here I am uh, trying to take on the biggest challenge of my life, uh, which is to get this country in shape uh, and get it back on its feet. Uh, so I am running as an independent presidential candidate for 2020. So that's a bit about me. Anything in and in between that, please feel free to ask. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, answer those I can. Um, oh, oh, we will ask. But let me <laughs> think of the independent presidential candidates. Yeah. And Take some profile. It really does take some profile. What brought you here? What made you decide? To <laughs> I I think it's the same thing. Who who brought that brought all of us here? I I think over time, um, and this is my personal thing. Over time, it's been the consistent. For me, for example, because I have been traveling quite a lot, I have seen what different countries have been able to do um, and what their capabilities were before they were able to achieve those things. Uh, it made me, it, my picture was a bit more obvious whenever I came to Ghana. I felt we had so much and this is not where we were supposed to be. I am not saying we haven't done anything. Um, I am saying that, you know, at the pace at which the world is moving and at the at the rate at which we have uh, uh, resources, human and otherwise, and where we are at now, it simply does not match. And then you come home and you see everything that the two uh, biggest political parties have done or achieved to this country. And, and you just realize, you know what, it's no more time to sit on the fence. Um, I worry about our young people who um, seem to want to do something, they have an idea what they want to do, and they are not having the support they need to do and, and, and to achieve the best that they can with themselves. I see our old folks who, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dread to go on pension in this country. It's almost as though going on pension is signing a death warrant, you know. Um, I see businesses who just want to blossom, and yet there's all this vindictiveness because 
you are either seen as an MPP business or an NDC business. And no business you know, wants to be seen that way. Some businesses just want to get work done and earn a good living and all that. So it's all these things. I have been in the diaspora. You talk to diaspora people and they're actually afraid to come back home because they feel that if you come back home and you don't know anybody, that's the end of you know you you know having a home to come back to. So it, it's the combination of all these things that brings you to the point where you realize you know what we cannot go down this route any much longer because you know what uh, this is this is not what it meant when we said God bless our homeland Ghana and make us great and strong. This is certainly not great and strong, and I and I think that. At this point, I just felt, you know what, this is a duty to all of us now. Certainly, I don't see it as, as a motivation. It's not, for me, it's not a motivational thing I'm doing, unfortunately. Um, I, for me, it's a duty. Uh, and I think we all have that duty to uh, to rise up and put this country where it, it genuinely belongs. And that, that goes for all of us as well, because where Ghana gets better, it gets better for all of us. So that, in a nutshell, is, is why I am here. Okay, I'm so sorry. There was a little bit of a disconnect from here, but I think we are back home. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you. I can. Good stuff. Thank That's you. Really right. So you came here because you want to do better for us. But I mean, when you speak to our Nigerian friends, they say Ghana is heaven. What exactly is wrong? What's well, wrong? I've, I've, I've lived in Nigeria. I mean, um, Nigeria is equally going through its own problem, and I and I want to very clear it's its own problem. Um, I and I've heard I've had a lot of Nigerian friends who think that comparatively we're doing okay, but the reality is that we, you know, we cannot be comparing ourselves to others in the same soup as us. That that's okay. totally that's totally not going to take us anywhere. We have every reason to be like every other country that is out there. And so I, I will not compare as to, I think, I think it's, uh, we've always been the black star of Africa, the pay setters, and I don't think it is up to us to be comparing ourselves. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not calling any country backward, but I just feel that if we do have to compare ourselves, we have every reason to compare ourselves to the best in the world out there. We might not be able to get where they've gotten to immediately, but that is where we should aspire to. So um, I hear the Nigerian story all right, but if it takes us to be even 10 times better than they are, um, and here's the reality, um, uh, Ama, the, the reality is that no country, even the ones that we call first world, they never stop where they are. They keep yeah. they keep pushing for the limits, and and I think we don't we are not less than them, and we should. We should. Okay, that's interesting. Yes, this is Mr. <laughs> Kupigan. He is uh, one of the independent presidential candidates. He's been very gracious in granting an interview. So ordinary people like us can hear his vision. <laughs> that's that's so that's so not right. I'm very ordinary. Those who know me will tell you that I'm very very ordinary. Um, well, George, you'll be surprised. Okay. You'll be surprised how ordinary I am. I don't know why people think if you're running for office, you should be anything above ordinary. Ordinary is is is, is the best form a human can be. In, you know so. Um, no. I'm, I'm 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 as ordinary as they come. <laughs> As ordinary people, we know ourselves and we don't put ourselves forward. <laughs> we stay in our little corner, we never move out to the little corner. We survive and that's about it. Okay. So some people have started throwing punches. Hold off a little bit with some of the technical things. We are just trying to get to know. So you won't know. we don't even know if he's a family man. He's told us a little bit about guitar and traveling. Hold up, hold up to the technical stuff. Let's get to know the man first. And then you do behind. So yeah. a question. So I'm trying to understand before the and everything else. Sure. Are you a little bit more about your current circumstances, family circumstances? What perspective do you have? Um, when you say my current circumstances, how do you mean, please? I just want to be sure I understand. 
Tell us about your family life. Tell us about who is okay. in your inner circle. Okay, who is in my inner circle? Well, um, I used to, <laughs> I, I used to be married once upon a time. Uh, I am divorced, um, um, but you know, I've got well, we've got kids, and the kid, my kids are with their mom now. Um, so I, I am no longer uh, currently married. I know the next question is going to be: So, aren't we having a first lady? Um, well, I you know I don't decide that, unfortunately. Um, if it happens, it happens. Who knows? We might even have the first royal wedding in Ghana ever. So I don't know. Um, but you know, currently my focus is to do what I'm doing, which is um, um, which is which is to 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 get this country where I feel that it should be. I have um, uh, one of the other things I never said is that I have three siblings. We're we're two boys and two girls, uh, two Monday bonds and two Friday bonds, very mathematically divided. Um, <laughs> uh, my father is an engineer, so let it not be a surprise. I'm a, um, he calculates everything. <laughs> um, so, so that's a bit about. Um, I mean, please feel free to ask any other um, direct questions um, as you may may wish to. Yes, I'm happy to answer any of them. A few people are itching, itching to get in. Joyce, hold off. Let's understand his vision before we collaborate him more. All right, relax. So, very the point heading in particular directions. But hold off. Let Let's see where he wants to go. Let's understand where he wants to go. Yes, please hold off. Somebody asked a question, and I'm mm. just going to say a little bit. So we've seen the reasons why you feel. We understand your circumstances a bit. That's great. What I want to know, what your vision is, what would you do for your Sorry, I didn't thing. hear that. I'm trying to understand what your broad vision is for your presidency. What would you want to be your legacy? What would you like to achieve for our people? Right. Right. Um, my, my vision is quite, uh, let me just, rather than just say a sentence or two, which is the textbook version of a vision, I'll rather cast it a bit wider. Um, so I, I am not coming, um, uh, pretending I can solve all the problems. Uh, that would be very uh, naive and very, um, um, very untrue of my person. Um, and so there are key things that we want to solve. My, my vision is to, we're taking about 10 key areas and dealing with them. Uh, there are 10 key areas we feel that if we can deal with uh, decisively, it will set us on a path to some level of continuity in, in delivering um, uh, good for this country. So um, if you take health, for example, we want to get the country to start to focus on primary health care uh, rather than a funeral economy. Um, if you take education, we want to focus on, you know, getting our young people to um, move away from, you know, being taught what to, what to, what to know rather than how to how to think. Um, and, and education for me is a very critical thing because one of the key things we want to do is to shape us in a such a way that our young people can begin to be positioned in the future just like the young people of any other country. Um, and for me, that translates into ensuring that we are teaching them competency skills. Um, we are teaching them entrepreneurial skills. We are teaching them technology skills. Uh, and, and, and that mathematics and the rest become a key element of, of their study. Um, we also want to change things like, and this is a critical thing for me where education is concerned. We want to change things like the, uh, the, the learning infrastructure. Um, uh, and to give you a quick example, I, I want to have an educational system in which if you tell me that student A is studying, um, say, auto engineering, for example, throughout his, his four or five years of studying auto engineering, I want him to be able to take a car apart and fix it back together. It's the only way he's going to understand what is involved in auto engineering, anything to do with a car. 
if you take a student studying accounting, I want him to leave the study of accounting, uh, at least getting a sense of how the most basic form of accounting software works. So we want to change what we have always termed educational infrastructure with until now has rather been just uh, building classrooms. It's not just about classrooms. Um, and then you talk about things like institutional reforms. I want to see a huge level of institutional reforms. And for me, that also includes changes to the constitution where we can make it happen. Uh, there are several elements in the constitution that I feel need, uh, have outlived their, their purpose for being there and that they need to get changed. Um, but also our uh, institutions, the public institutions, for example, need to change. You know, the way we spend money, what we even spend money on, uh, basic things like that need to start shifting. Um, and, I, and I see somebody has already asked the question, how many ministers I have? That's part of the institutional change that we want to bring. I, I don't want to have more than 15 ministers. I don't see the need for it. You know, combining, you know, the substantive ministers and everything else, we should, this is a very small country. Um, and so we shouldn't be wasting money like that. So there are various changes that we want to see in institutional reforms. And then tourism is another big area that, I feel it's a low hanging fruit that we've never really uh, 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 utilized properly, even though we have everything working in our favor. Um, so I want to be able to combine tourism, our culture and the arts, the arts which we have so much downplayed in this country, even though again, we have massive resources in that area. And I think for me, if we can combine tourism and the arts, we would have gone a long way to create an entirely new economy for ourselves. Um, and then last but not the least, and I'm just talking about the top five key areas, last but not the least is the area of uh, 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 agriculture. And largely what we want to do with agriculture is it, it currently is very fragmented. So you, we still have this tiny, tiny, little, little smallholder farms that value wise, so even though they are putting it a lot, value wise, we're not getting a lot out. And I think it's about time we start to expand our agricultural setup um, and make it a whole more wholesale rather than, you know, tiny, small scale. You know, well, the world is evolving. We should be evolving. Uh, and usually when I talk about agri, people think it's just farming. No, it includes, you know, fishing and everything. You know, uh, uh, I, I used to be a fisherman, so this is very dear to me, you know, uh, you, the government sends petrol uh, pre-mixed fuel to go to the, you know, what they call them, fishermen, and it never gets there. If it gets there, it's being remixed again and is short and all that. We have plans to correct all of that. But even more crucial for me where, where fishermen are concerned is that we need more patrols on our seas uh, and to stop those Chinese from coming into our waters. But even more crucially, we need to start helping our fishermen to move from, you know, one canoe per, per household to coming together in a form of uh, business sense to, to start, you know, we should start helping them to buy trawlers and all that. So that we're looking at this on a larger scale rather than the petty, petty scale we, we're currently looking at. So that's a gist of, uh, I'm almost out of breath. <laughs> I've landed big fish in my sea. I mean, I, I am an educationist, I'm a teacher. So obviously right. education needs to be one of the big ones. I like to declare right. my hands so everybody knows what we're coming from. My own a tour company registered in Ghana and also in the United Arab Emirates. So tourism is another big area of interest. For me. Right. right. It's the reason that health would be a big concern for me. So we're going to delve into some of those things. Then I want to start from education. Now, people say a lot of things about our education educational system i want to know your very honest very frank assessment of where you think that educational system currently is what's the current state of affairs no hold back um, <laughs> I, 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 genuinely, <laughs> I genuinely think we are not where we're supposed to be in a lot of ways, in an awful lot of ways. Um, take early, early year education. We've got all this uh, primary nursery schools springing up all over the place. I see them in my neighborhood all over the place. 
Um, there is no regulation whatsoever. I see kids who come out of those schools and when you speak to them, the kind of uh, English they speak and the kind of, you know, uh, upbringing they're getting from some of these schools, is uh, it's, uh, it's appalling. Um, I feel we our regulation in the educational sector is 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 gone to the to the dogs, unfortunately. Um, and I think something needs to be done about that. It's the only way we are going to ensure that a certain level of competency is being developed from childhood up. Because if we don't get it right at that level, we're not getting it right at JSS level or SSS. So at every level you can talk about AMA. If you take JSS, for example, it's 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 gone to shambles. The, the we GSS was set up to start introducing our young people to technical education. Um, and the idea is that by the time they leave GSS, they would have made up their minds whether um, technical education is what they are wired for or not. That has been totally watered down. And to think that up to this point, our technical education does not it involve uh, IT is 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 sad. It's very sad. Um, and then not to talk about the fact that most GSS these days don't even have tools to 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 work with. You know, then I don't know why we are even calling it a technical level uh, to start with. And then you go to SHS. Um, I uh, a lot a lot has to change. Is what I I, I can say. I'm a, um. Uh, we can talk about this for eons of, of, of time, but um, the Easy. reality for me is, uh, so I my, one of the biggest problem is with the tertiary institutions. Um, I, I feel, and this is where, because you see the technical education, sorry, the tertiary education for me is the level from which you get into industry. And okay. for me, if it is not reflecting what industry is expecting or needs our qualified people to do, then we have actually failed in that regard. Um, I gave examples earlier. I, I have seen students who have come out of engineering, building engineering and all that, who have gone into the field fresh and um, the very basic things like calibrating um, uh, a skill, a laser skill, they cannot do. And that should worry us. Um, and I, I don't want to talk about the worst ones I have seen. I'm not trying to denigrate anybody, but, and I don't blame the students for that. I blame us because, you know, we, we are the ones in charge of designing the curriculum, uh, making sure that uh, the educational infrastructure is in place. If that is not happening, and if industry is complaining, then we have a problem. One of the key things I want to see is to be able to bring industry into part of the curriculum setting process. As to why that is not a, uh, an already ongoing agenda, I don't know why. I want to see people in technical education in the, in the industries um, um, accepting and collaborating with government for apprenticeship programs, you know, as part of the the, the, the training process for students whilst they are in school. Um, you know, so there's, there's a whole lot that I feel we need, it, it really needs to change. And then I talk about competency skills at the universities. Um, I would love to see competency skills being taught um, at every level throughout university. Um, People, by the time they leave university, irrespective of what course you're studying, should know the key and underpinnings of how to communicate with, with, with teams, uh, how to operate as a team, uh, should understand the very basic of uh, things like uh, um, using the, the, the internet. I'm a, look, I've, I've, I got, I got a, a laptop for a young uh, university student, okay? Uh, and they did not even know how to use Google. Yeah, I mean, Google, what's that? Right. That Google is a search engine. Is so Google your friend? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Google is actually a friend of mine. You know? <laughs> but 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 you see, these are the things. So I, 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 for example, our libraries, for example, here, here's the thing for me. I want to go to any of our public universities, and our library is all um, is all 
it's all wired up, wired up in the sense that we should have e-readers in those libraries. Um, we should have free internet and they should be plugged into five or six other universities outside of Ghana. Where we are, we are exchanging, you know, learning materials. Um, um, our universities that are studying business should be able to plug into the Harvard Business uh, Research uh, Library. Why is that not happening? Why, why do we have to uh, always be a step behind what the rest of the world has access to? It's, it's always been my problem. So for me, there's a whole there's a whole plethora of things that needs to be reshaped where our education is concerned if we're going to uh, uh, start getting uh, folks to get plugged into the future, just like mm -hmm. students in other countries are, are plugged into the future. Um, Oh, it's exciting. I have questions and I'm going to dig. <laughs> I mean, um, at the moment, I don't know if uh, you actually managed to get your hands on the current policies. Have you seen the current policy on TVET and STEM education? Have you actually seen them? I have actually seen the TVET one. Um, no, I haven't seen the, the current one, the, if there's a latest one on, on the STEM. Um, but I have my own views about STEM. Um, and they are quite radical views. Um, I don't know if you, <laughs> this is the place to show, to share it, but I have very <laughs> radical views. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think for me, I first of all, I think STEAM is, um, so I, I prefer the, the science, technology, engineering, arts, and then mathematics. Um, um, and, and one of the key things I want to see happen in that is that we've been very terrible at the way we teach mathematics, uh, which is why it is not appealing to a lot of children. Um, unfortunately, how we do in mathematics will determine a lot about how the, where this country gets to many years from now. And I think we need to correct that. Young people, yeah. very, very young people need to see mathematics just like they see reading and comprehension. It has to happen. Um, because it's, my, it's, it's, it's numeracy and literacy in some places. It's numeracy it's and literacy. It's numeracy and literacy, and they're side by side. They are. Do we, yeah, but here's a sad story you don't know, Amma, is that 25% or less than 25% of our children who have been in our educational system for at least six years uh, in the very early stages can read. Less than 25%. I think that's inflated. I think that is, is well, I'm being generous and being diplomatic. That's less no, than 25%. Yeah. But I mean, that, that is still a worry, Amma, that... If, if we even have 75% of people going into primary school and then on to GSS and then on to secondary school, it tells us that they are going into those sort of higher levels of education without even the basics being gotten right. So um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just flustered. Uh, I mean, oh, you I'm, should be. Forgive me, education is one of my passionate areas because I've always said education is our weapon of mass elevation. If we can get it right, we can elevate a lot of us um, uh, across the country. Um, and I think one of the key things uh, we are going to also do is to help us. Uh, there are people who are falling off the educational ladder and we need to bring them up back to STEAM. Some not out of their own fault, but out of circumstances and we need to get them back on the ladder to, to, to add some value for their lives, if they so wish it to be. Um, but um, this so, is where we are at. Mm. Not a very um, flattering place to find yourself, in fact. I think we need to be sincere about where we are. I don't want us to kid ourselves about where we are. I think when you see some of those official numbers, it makes me laugh because you go about town and you interact with the kids on the ground, you don't need to be a statistician to know that the numbers are inflated. You don't even need to be a technocrat to know. Just watching a few things, who is actually teaching these kids, the fact that it's actually not regulated as tightly as it is. I know people who are apparently teachers, and if they came in a mile of my kids, I, I would kill them. There are some people <laughs> There are some people who are apparently teachers, and if they came within a mile of my kids, I'd be shooting something and killing something. 
because I really don't think people like that should be anywhere near teaching your people. So then it brings me to my next question, Mary. What would be the three things, and I'm ironing it down to three, which three things do you have in your strategy to overhaul education in Ghana? And I'm looking for tangible here. Right. I, I think I've already given you a hint of one. One of them is that we do want to take a second look at uh, learning infrastructure. Um, and, and that is very key to me. It cuts across board because you only learn by doing. Um, and people might say, oh, that doesn't apply to children. It's a lie because it, children learn a lot by playing. Um, yeah. Amma, you and I know that the children of Ghana have been We've actually been very evil towards the children of Ghana. Children of Ghana do not grow these days being children. They, they don't have a place to play, um, not even in the schools themselves, or even if they go home, they don't have a place to play. And you take something out of being a child from kids by doing that. And we want to see that change. So when we talk about learning infrastructure, we are talking about it from uh, early years all the way to tertiary. We want people to learn using what they would eventually meet in industry. Familiarization and, and learning by doing, that is key for me. The second... <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> the current philosophy where, you know, in tertiary school, for example, you, you have to repeat what you are taught and you cannot think outside of what you are taught and you get marked down simply because you are, you are thinking outside of what you are taught. It's, 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 it's a murder pedagogy around it and everything um, has to change. Um, I know you are smiling on because I'm using terms that only educationists use, but that tells you how passionate I am about education. But so we do need to change our curriculum. It, it currently is the standard, uh, you know, uh, process of setting the curriculum. I, I think that has evolved and gone past its status. We need to start learning from nursery school to able to even reach that level at the very highest point. Um, um, and so that there is, for me, there is a lot of work to be done, but I think it is work that is necessarily required to be done. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question, but those are the three key areas I would uh, be looking at. <laughs> I hope I have. I hope I have. I want to go to people, actually. The world moved from instructive-based education. It hasn't moved. It hasn't changed. And it's one of the reasons why we struggle to compete when we go abroad, when we meet contemporaries from elsewhere. It's because the curriculum narrows the student's ability to develop wider. So we need to go constructivist, for sure. But what, what would you do to actually make that paradigm shift happen in the quickest possible time, in, an, in, in a place which has always been constructivist? <laughs> well, I, I, I think the, the, the one of the quickest ways to start is by, so one of the things, regions and having a total overhaul, um, we've learned from just uh, the free SHS. And so um, we would want to run um, a pilot project within two regions, whole regions. Um, and I think we're going to start from, um, if I can if I can remember well what we've written in our manifesto, but one of the key areas we're going to start from is, is training, uh, 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 teacher training. Um, because if we don't get that right to learning from others, um, First, people to see whether changes happen, those changes or not. So, um, um, until this is all of networks and get our schools plug network so that it's not very restricted. Like you are saying, uh, Amma, all that knowledge is not available in Ghana. So, we should be able to get them to have access, of course, some level of control on those access. It needs to travel. Uh, that's for me, as a young person, that we can't be restricting them to, to be restricting them rather to how to learn and then allow them to learn as much as they can. That's part of the philosophy, by the way. <laughs> I like the philosophy process for sure. But I'm bringing you back again. I'm trying to, I know a lot of things are st still on the wraps and whatnot, but I need to delve underneath the wraps sometimes. I need to ask you about EdTech. About what? what Educational technology tech policy. I do. 
Actually, I do. Uh, well, um, I, I, the reason why I jumped to that question was we, we got this right because we just saw what we had put together and we realized that this is exactly what would have been needed for a time like this. And so for us, there's one arm of us which is quite excited about the fact that we, we are thinking forward where the education of this country is concerned. And so we do have an ed tech um, uh, policy uh, and it's a twofold policy. Um, one side of it is what sort of tech needs to be studied within the curriculum. And the other side of it is what tech needs to be put in place to make curriculum happen or the teaching of it happen. Okay. Okay. And um, now that is very heavy on funding. You've, you've got to be honest about it. Ed tech is expensive. It's not cheap. It is. <laughs> but there's, the, where would the funding, I mean, I'm, uh, one of the things we need to know is that, look, as, as a government, whenever you, you need money to get something done, you will get money. Um, there's, there's, I, I'm not sure we're talking, but we've got a totally whole new, uh, sorry, not new, but a, a whole set of things that we are intending to do to make sure that wherever funding needs to come from, it comes from. Um, we are also actually even going to monetize indiscipline in this country uh, because it's a lot of money to make out of indiscipline. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, very so so I, I think money can always be made um, in our sector, for example, and the health sector. In fact, inefficiencies, the biggest sort of source of inefficiency in our country is in the government machinery and the health sector. And if we can cut down on some of those inefficiencies, by, by the way, I, if you notice, I'm an accountant and I, and I am very fixated about value for money because I work in international development. You are forced to spend one dollar and get out of one dollar or one pound what others have spent five dollars or five pounds to get. So I am very, very wide when it comes to delivering value for money. And so I'm very heavy on efficiency. In fact, my team would even tell you that um, it, it becomes a drag sometimes because sometimes a simple thing to get done and you know paid for, I want to know if there is a better alternative to getting it done. Um, okay. There's a young man who almost cried on me because he we wanted to run a small feeding program and we had to change the, bu the budget like five times because I wanted us to get the most out of every CD we were going to spend. And so, you know, that that is going to follow this government through, uh, God willing, we get it, uh, through everything. Uh, and I think education is one area we can squeeze in a lot of inefficiencies and make and, and use money uh, wisely for other things. Okay. I mean, I'm fixated with education. I always say to people, education cuts across a lot of the industries. Once you get education right, a lot of things almost automatically fall into place somewhat. It just becomes right. just certain things. I will come back right. and we will help with the aspects of education because my goal <laughs> is one of the very things is security. So Daniel says, uh, very important in all his submission is security. And what are his views on security? Where do you think we stand in terms of security? What needs to change and what would you do about it? I, I think our biggest threat where security is concerned um, is largely that we are not aware that the, the era of security has moved from the physical security to um, other forms of security. Um, and for me, that is crucial. It's crucial because those other forms of threats to our security, i.e. Uh, internet security and all that, it's, it's a threat, it's a very viable threat in itself. Uh, you know, you don't want, look, I keep saying that it's, I think nobody has just decided to target us and shut us down because a lot of people could if they wanted to, you know. Um, and I, so for me, in terms of security, I think internally, um, I wouldn't say the threat is uh, actually. Uh, let me not say that because there is a there is an internal inherent threat. Um, but in terms of security on a wider scale, there are three areas I see a threat in. One of them is the uh, um, the the very 
uh, online security that we are faced and we are not very much even aware that it's there. That's one area that um, I feel we need to strengthen ourselves uh, in. Um, and the reason why that is not happening is that um, Ahmad, the reality is that no well-educated young person who has studied IT for all his life in school and come out and done a bit for himself wants to go and work in the police service. Uh -huh. yeah. Why not? Are we not patriotic anymore? It's 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 not about it's it patriotism. Okay, let's not go into the whole patriotism because I have my views about patriotism. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not holding back. Um, I, I, but I, I just want to ask. <laughs> See, I'm a. Yes, sir. Let me just say that our, fo our police force needs a lot of help. Okay. They need a lot of help in order to attract the authority they once had. They need a lot of help to be able to attract the right caliber of people to be in there. One of the things that has remained a threat to our own internal security is that over the years, the NDC and the NPP as part of their reward system for coming into power is that they have all these people they need to reward for making the most noise during campaign. So um, they throw them and get them, you know, absorbed into the police services and all that, whether they qualify to be in there or not. What that means is that we are over time diluting the police service and the quality of our police service with every other person who one way or another is not supposed to be in there. Um, and for me, that in itself is a threat because many, just about a few, a couple of months ago, we we're talking about vigilantes and how they were formed by the political parties. And then we, we, we got to a point where we asked them to dismantle those vigilantes. And they said they did. The question is, where did they dismantle them to? Where, where are they now? And that's a uh -huh. question I live with all Ghanaians. So the reality for me is that even our own structure for ensuring security has become a security threat itself. And that is something we need to take a critical look at. Somebody asked me, won't you be doing the same thing? And I said to them, look, the reality is that I'm not going into this process with the so-called my boys, so that when we're done, I have to fix my boys. I don't have my boys. I have, I have patriotic people who are, who believe in what we're doing and are helping to make that happen. I don't have uh, a thousand or 2000 people who are looking to get a job in the police simply because they are going to be making the most noise. Every single person who is doing this with me is doing it because they believe that this needs to get done. <laughs> I have to laugh here, I apologize. It's because listen, Kwame Kwashi has a statement and I need to pick these up, listen. He says he's disappointed by his statement. God willing, we forget. Listen, I know there's this new wisdom, and all of you have your own beliefs and whatnot. But one of the new, one of the old wisdoms is to appreciate that there are many different perspectives, right? Different perspectives, different ways of speaking. The way you say things. <laughs> there are a few people who think they've discovered something new as wisdom. And everything else is on rise, and everything else has to be measured on that one. <laughs> you've got to be careful, mate. You've got to be very careful on that one. I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let that particular one go. <laughs> I mean, well, I, let me just say, Amma, that as pragmatic as I, I may be most of the time, I am also a man of faith. Um, and so, if, if mentioning God and his willingness to sustain life in all of us is offensive, then I would like to offend even some more because I'm a Christian. You cannot take that away from me. I believe in God. Um, I believe in the life he gives me. And so um, I don't know if I'll be alive tomorrow. So when I say God willingly, it's, 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 it's purely from the perspective that 
you know what if god gives us bread tomorrow then what we want to do will get done it's 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 that simple really it's not i don't think it's a sign of weakness or anything of the sort but thank you for bringing that up it is humility in your humanity and there's a group of people who no longer acknowledge it and everybody <laughs> else is a fool and there's a lot of them <laughs> and every time we'll, I come, we'll I get there, Emma. We'll get there. <laughs> we need to bring everybody along. So um, I'm yeah. sure Kwame will drop me a message after this. But you know, we'll we'll get everybody there. Um, that is what we believe in. Everybody needs to be on this boat. Um, we we can't leave anybody behind. Uh, actually, I was working for International Lead when that term became a big term in the UK international development scene, leave no one behind. Uh, I think yeah. it's spread wide and far, and I'm proud to have been part of the early, you know, people who uh, brought that on board. So we will leave nobody behind. Um, Are you close to that one? Look, it's really important that we clarify things. You know, he says he believes in you. It's not an attack. He just wants a firm statement from him. But again, still Kwame, Viva. We're doing this together. I believe in you too. Yeah, that's we what it takes. Be, we have to believe in each other. I mean, I'm hoping, I know we, we are going to a few places. I'm hoping that this might not be the only time you come because I want to really understand what the vision is. I really want to delve deep. I want to sit down for one session and do just education and have my pen and paper and my calculator and ask you a lot of questions and make sure they uh, by the time you and I finish education, all of Ghana is going to turn into teachers. <laughs> well, look, we do need it. It's one of the things we do need say, them, but we also need some doctors, you know. <laughs> no, not to but no I, I totally understand what you look. My my philosophy, and and I I have had the chance to work with a number of economists and all that. And, and, and some of them will tell you, and this is what I have learned working with economists and being curious about economics myself, is that the reality is that, and this is just to buttress the point you're sharing about education. Really, if you look at the way the world works, and I like to share this with people, that the way the world really works is that the world really works, buys and sells one commodity. And that commodity is knowledge. Yeah. The more complex the knowledge you your country has, it becomes. It's as simple as that. Exactly. The very far end of that spectrum of knowledge is, is knowledge that you don't need to raise a hand. You don't need to learn a lot to know that if you put one uh, uh, corn of maize, sorry, one grain of maize in the, in the earth, rainfall, whatever, it'll grow up by itself. You don't need a lot of knowledge around that. But you equally need a higher spectrum of knowledge to be able to produce an X-ray machine. And so there's a wide spectrum. And I think what our aim is, is that we should be able to gradually move from the most basic form of knowledge to the most complex forms of knowledge because it's the only way that we can even turn around and solve the very basic problems we've not been able to solve this, this number of years. That has to come from your curriculum. Whether you are a skills-based curriculum or not, it shapes the mentality of your people. And if you have this skills-based mentality, you actually think wider. When problem solving is actually taught from the very first day you walk into the classroom, it becomes a nature and you don't even think about it. When you have to chew poor parts and forget, from the very first day you enter the classroom, the die is cast. For me, I think for a lot of the die is cast the very first day we walk into our nurseries. The die is cast. Right. It becomes a deconstruction and reconstruction exercise that individuals do to some level of success. But we have right. to avoid it if the basics were right. And that's why I like to sit for education a lot. But let me and ask you. Oh dear, have I just taken over the show? 
apologies for that. I lost signal. I thought I just took over your show, Amma. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was asking. Joyce had a question. I was trying to get Joyce's question. And it's the question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Joyce? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, I, I it's not like number 10. Who's asked it? I mean, it's popped up quite a few times, and I've Sorry? had it sitting. No, other people have asked it as well because people are curious. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I <laughs> let me just say that I do know. Um, Mr. Kofi Kurang thing, um, we we are familiar with each other. I, I know him. Um, we let me just say that we've spoken a few times, um, and and anybody who understands how this works um, understands that you know these decisions are just not made in in vacuum. Um, it would take the two of us, um, and so. You know, I think people should continue hoping for that. Um, I believe that um, if that is the way, this is the right way to go, that both of us will, will make that decision um, and, um, and, and let the people of Ghana know. Um, I think I, I, I have very high regards and respect for Mr. Kurang Ting um, um, and for what he's doing, um, and, and indeed for other independent candidates who are in the league of this. But um, I just want to say that, you know, that's obviously not a decision I can make by myself. I'm working with a team. I'm working with a, a good number of very good people, very patriotic people. Um, and I want to say here and now, and I want to put it on record that every single thing we have done with our campaign and our manifesto and everything else in between has been for the purpose of putting Ghana first. If it works for Ghana to win in the process, we would always do it. And so, um, you know, uh, whether myself or Mr. Koranting uh, hold the banner together to move this country forward, um, you know, whichever way it will be exciting, that's Kofi Kofi uh, for Ghana 2020. Uh, well, there's 20 and 20, so Kofi and Kofi, not bad uh, for the sake of rhyme. <laughs> um, but listen, I, I, no, this is a serious question, and I, and I just want to say that Mr. Kofi and I um, are engaged. We are very engaged. We are, we are continuing to engage. And, uh, you know, if this is the right way to go, you would definitely hear from both of us. You're definitely here. I think that the important thing to note is that he's doing this for Ghana as much as I am doing this for Ghana. And so, you know, um, we, we do have to engage to be able to align. And, and if we're not aligning, then we can't go anywhere. But I want to assure people that we are engaging and that's a very crucial part of the process. Um, and hopefully, you know, we will get to the point that um, if we can both see and say, you know what, hey, we both need to do this. Why not? I, I don't think um, having interacted with Mr. Kranting a few times, a good number of times, actually, um, he is not the type to put himself before um, anything else. And so um, I likewise, I would always put Ghana first in anything and everything. So um, I am sure that if this is the right thing that people are expecting, then um, I pray God those expectations happen and, and you know, in good time they will. Okay. All right. Joy, you're going to have to take that one and you're going to have to work with that one. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Martin, yes, you need his answer now, but you also have to give him room to maneuver. So, you've asked him a question. Give, I think you're so you Sorry, we have give to him give him what? No, I said she has to give you room to operate and maneuver because <laughs> it's asking a question on the spot and asking for a knee jerk answer. So sometimes, yeah, it would be nice if you could get your instantaneous answer, but probably not on this occasion, and you have to accept it sometimes. Right, Kwame Kwashi has another one on constitution, and that's another one we keep going to. He says the 1992 constitution is not serving Ghana well. What are your plans for constitutional change? 
Um, I, I think in large part, uh, I wouldn't say the entirety, people make the statement that the entire constitution is not working. That is not actually correct. And I think we need to be very pragmatic about these things. Uh, the same constitution has kept this country safe for a while. Um, I agree there are several parts of it that have outlived their purpose. Uh, there are also some parts of it that did not even have a purpose to leave from the start. And so it is those areas that have become, um, that are working against our greater good um, that need to, <laughs> oh God, sorry, I'm just saying some coffee square root, forgive me. Um, um, but <laughs> um, I think if my mathematic knowledge still serves me right, that would be coffee square. But anyway, um, yep. just to go back to the point, um, not to belabor it, but I, I do believe there are certain elements of our constitution that need changing, um, uh, very critical parts that need changing. Um, and, and so I am all for constitutional change. However, you know, what we desire is one thing, um, how constitutionally um, the provisions allow us to make that happen is another thing to explore. Um, you know, um, in terms of, you know, how is the process going to happen? What do all, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer. And so, um, you know, my, my constitutional team in government would have to look into all of those things. But I want to say this on record that if anything at all, I'll probably be the first aspirant or candidate for whom you will see it actually put on his manifesto that he wants constitutional reforms done. And it's not that we haven't actually carried out a reform process. We've carried out a review process um, that ended at that. It was, nothing was done. The recommendations were in, uh, uh, taken forward. And, and we're, we're trying to look into that, why that happened, and why no other government after that has pushed for those uh, uh, reviews and recommendations to be implemented. So um, I am all for constitutional reforms. Uh, uh, to the gentleman who asked the question. Um, and I'm committed to seeing those areas that need to change, change. Uh, there are key areas that surround, you know, uh, the freedom of the president to elect his own ministers without necessarily going into parliament for them uh, to get 50% plus one out of parliament. There is the constitutional reform that requires that at least 30% of people employed within the public sector are women. And I think that is a very crucial thing um, to pursue um, in order to help with the, you know, uh, gender equity uh, progress of our country. And, and that has not happened. So uh, I think the constitutional recommendations from the uh, review process did bring out a lot of very interesting uh, recommendations that would can only push this country forward. Um, and so I am for those things, and, and hopefully that when the mandate uh, uh, gets to us, we would we would we, sh we will we shall actually get that done. Now I'm being emphatic, so that I'm not saying God willing, um, but we shall we shall make sure those constitutional reviews are are are, are, are made to happen. Okay, so we we've, we've sort of discussed your results with one uh, other candidate. Actually, are you in contact with, I didn't even know we had any other independent candidates, which is rather funny. I, I know actually know about five, five or so. So there's Mr. Kurangting, there's myself, there is uh, uh, Jacob Oseyabwa, uh, there is uh, Mr. Ampofo, uh, and there is also, um, and, uh, I think there are two other gentlemen, so in all about, five or six I, I am aware of. Um, who knows, maybe one more or two more may join the process. Um, but I, I think at least they're about, uh, Carl Morgan is the other gentleman I've heard about. Um, so at least six I know of, including myself. Now, I mean, that makes it difficult knowing the terrain we are at. And that's why Kwame asked that question. We know things are where we're from and we do know that we can't dilute this office we've got to concentrate efforts in order to actually make any significant impact so he wanted to go the youth won't change and we are looking to the independent 
this form a coalition. And he thinks if there is a coalition possible, the rest will be history. That's the question. Sorry, I didn't quite get the last end of the question, Nama. It was a statement. He says that we, the youth, want change and we want all the independent candidates to form a coalition. The rest will be history in the making. It was a statement, not a question. Right. I, I let me just say to Kwame that I something like this is being you know um, I, the, I think the good thing people need to know is that we the independent candidates have started to engage. I certainly am engaging with a good number of them, um, and a good number of them are engaging with me. Um, and so, you know, it might look like time is fast spent, but I, I assure you that. It, we, this thing needs to be done and done right, and it will be done. Uh, that is a guarantee. And so, you know, some of the things he's saying are things that you're more very, very likely to see in the next coming uh, weeks, uh, maybe even. Um, so um, let me just assure Kwame that, you know, I am in touch with a lot of the independent candidates and other independent teams or units. Um, I, I believe in, you know, unified forces and so uh what needs to be done will get done uh, but in all this for the greater good of this country okay there is there is also the you know um so yeah we'll, we'll do what we need to get done for the greater good that i can assure everybody of um where i am concerned it will be done okay that's interesting so hansen has a question he says can the independents form one party to fight MPP and DC? I, I think he sort of answered that one, right? Marie, hi, hi, Marie. Good evening, sis. You are welcome. Uh, Polly says, I don't think just the coalition does it. What about stop voting for all DC MPP? That is the surest solution. A coalition for the sake of it will not help. For the I don't understand what I want to come to clarify more. Voting NDC, what does that mean? What does that mean? Are you suggesting we vote for the independent individually, or what, what exactly are you actually going towards? I want to understand it properly so we do it justice. Right, I want to pick a huge one because we all we know the part of the problem currently have is to do with the current CS of our political parties. We know that that's the crux of the problem. Funding is an issue. So we want to know where your funding comes from. Who is your financier? You are my financier. Man. Oh, me? Oh, then we have problems. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so I, I, so when it comes to funding, um, of course, we've learned lessons. A lot of what we're doing is also, uh, taking into consideration lessons that have been learned from what the big parties have done and gotten wrong. We don't want to do the same thing. Um, we are crowdfunding. Um, okay. From day one, every single thing we have done has been funded by the very ordinary people of this country. Every single thing every single thing whether they are in the diaspora or whether they're in ghana it doesn't matter every single person who has decided that he believes or she believes in what we're doing have been a source of funding for this and i'm a one of the things i want to say here and now is that for me that is the real sign of commitment of the people who are you know uh standing behind me and uh, for a lot of times it gives me the energy to keep going i have had old ladies you know how if you go to the villages you, old ladies they wrap their city notes at the hem of their cloth right um i don't know if your grandma used to do that but right 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 i, I have had old ladies who have unfolded the hem of the uh, cloth and giving me five CDs. And I have taken it. Oh, yes, yes, bless them. Because yeah. for them, yes, because you see, we need people to understand that if indeed 
those who finance parties are the ones who control the country when people come into power, then I want every Ghanaian to finance this project, to finance this agenda. So that when I come into office, I know that I am not tied to some one man, one woman somewhere who wants to control who becomes minister. I don't need that. I want to be able to rise up every morning knowing that my duty and I owe everything of where we are, are to the Ghanaian people. And so students have actually organized programs and just asked me to show up. Old people have organized community engagements, carried out the refreshment, have asked me to show up. Young working adults have done that. People in the diaspora have said, here is $100, here is $50, here is $20. What it has taught us, Ama, is that what we need is people. What it has also taught us is that because we know we don't have a huge chunk of money sitting down somewhere, we've actually learned to be very, very efficient in what we do. So we are always trying to find out what is the most productive way to use 10 cities, to use 20 cities, because we know that we don't have 200 cities to just go and blow off. So every single money we have, we try to find out. So eventually I say to people, look, if we cannot be efficient in the way we run our, our, our campaign, we cannot expect to be efficient when we get into office. It's not gonna happen. And so for me, I just, I'm just grateful that this is an opportunity for us to also show people that with the very limited resources we have, um, sometimes no resources at all, people are still committed to pushing this agenda and getting it where we need to get it. I've got um, um, engineers who are in this, I've got communication experts who are in this, um, I've got, um, media people who are doing things that would have cost us thousands, tens of thousands. But if they've thrown their heart into this and they are doing it, and for them, I am very grateful. We've got people outside of the, uh, outside of Ghana in the States, some in Canada, some in UK, um, elsewhere. Amma, you are doing an interview with me. This is helping the process. I'm not saying you are lying to me, uh, uh, so I make that clear. But, but, <laughs> I'm growing. I mean, it's sensational that I extend right. an invitation to you guys from polling yeah. because I guess that gives me a lot of hope. Tells me that right. when you have to say beforehand, right. it could never get an aspirant honor an invitation by a single woman. It's a great risk to come on my show because I don't script. You don't know what I was going to ask you. You had absolutely no idea, and even I didn't know what I was going to ask you. So you could have ruined your political career on the one interview with me. If Don't worry, we would have ruined it together, so that's okay enough. <laughs> you know what? Because I, I am one of the people who think our media is compromised. Our media is compromised in my view. <laughs> I felt the media would get the information to the ordinary people who are my friends and who watch me. There will be no switch on the cameras. So we are right. I'm not here. Right. Right. Um, yes, if I had a dime to give um, your campaign, I would send it to you. But for some of us, it might be so, the time to stay here to chat. My find you the person who will send you a dime or two to help you with the campaign. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody is on board. Everybody is welcome to get on board. Uh, please, by all means, you know, this is, you know, I always say this is about Ghana. This is not about me. It's not about any individual member of my team. Um, and I've said this and my team knows that, you know what, at the end of the day, um, let nobody for one second think that, you know, um, this is a personal agenda. It is not. Um, I could have just gone out, found a job, uh, hide in some little tiny country and just, you know, uh, face life the way uh, everybody does. But um, for me, this is a duty. It's crucial that we get this country somewhere um, that it's deserving to be at. Uh, look, I keep saying, and, and this is not to be overly too uh, charismatic, uh, or Pentecostal, but I, I have always said that, you know, 
the 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 end place of where we were supposed to be as a country has always been written in the first line of our of our national anthem you know god bless our homeland ghana and make us great and strong we were always destined to be great and strong if we are not getting there it is because of us we are the ones who are not getting us there and part of not getting us there is to stop voting those who we've been voting for for 27 years and who have not gotten us anywhere close to uh, great or close to strong something needs to give something needs to change all right anyway so some of us a huge one now uh, can we diasporans move back home confidently with you as presses well, I can tell you one thing for a fact. We actually have um, a policy agenda um, for diasporans, um, believe it or not. Yes. Yes, Emma, we do. We do. Tell me. Go on. Please See, I, I have been a diasporan myself. Let me, let me tell you something. I've been a diasporan myself. We have a huge, in fact, a colossus of um knowledge base capital base um and a whole lot of others of ghanaian origin that is just sitting out there in the diaspora the one main reason why most of them don't want to come back is that they don't believe the system is open enough for them yeah. to come in with the mindset that they may have you know evolved into the openness of thinking the need to challenge status quo uh, and the need to push for the ultimate of excellence most people don't feel that they can come back then the need to request for customer care in every single thing that is done even by government most people don't feel that they can get that when they come uh back home it's for that reason that most people would rather stay out there look the reality look, let me tell you a little story when i went to the uk okay um i did not get a job immediately as an accountant i had to i had to do cleaning jobs i had to do um i had to work as um oh what's this one so i did cleaning i did uh security i did uh i worked on a construction site um, and I think one other thing, before I got my first accounting job, okay, but here's the thing, Amma, I know people today who still do some of those things. When in oh, fact, yeah. they could, yes, when in fact they could have been in Ghana and, and they could come back to Ghana and attempt or strive to be something else. But they prefer that with all the conditions out there, it did not matter what job they did. Here is the thing, the same person who is doing a cleaning job and gets recognition and respect in the UK would hardly come back to Ghana and want to do a cleaning job. But if they come to Ghana, they will go bankrupt within 12 months. And that's well, a that's another thing. side of the story. So, that's so the, I said in, yeah, I said at home, so and one the of the I have, it, it, right. it takes a break brave soul. Sometimes it takes insanity. Knowing that I could do, it, it takes insanity. I want to take operation up to Ghana in comparison to keeping it in the United Arab Emirates, tax-free, easy access to everything else. And it's insanity, really. Patriotism bordering on insanity is what brings people home. But sometimes, right. if you calculate, it will bankrupt you. And at that point, you have no use to anybody anyway. And that is the reason but, but, but why. But here's the thing I also want to say to diasporans is that, you see, the more of us who take that bold step of stepping back and making something change, the quicker we can actually get it done. That's the other side of that coin, you know. That the, 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 but I'm a, the, that's the truth. The truth is that, you see, if if just a few of us trickle back in to make a big change happen, it's yeah. not going to be as easy as if a lot more of us come back to push that change to happen. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's got to be a balance. People also need to be willing to push the boundaries and make sure that we go all out to make this happen. And that's commitment because 
it, the more we stay out and feel that we can just do something from there, the lesser things will change drastically and quickly down here. And so we need all hands on deck. We need our fellow brothers who are already here, who have to live this life on a day-to-day -day basis and who are now willing to make a change happen. And we also need people who have the capital out there or the expertise uh, uh, to come and join forces with the, the local expertise and the, the, the capital that is locally bred here. And, and together, you know, it's that, it's that forcefulness of togetherness that needs to make this happen. So my appeal to those in the diaspora is let's make this happen. The reality is that we can actually make it happen. We want to come. I mean, I'm strict, so I do it anyway, knowing the rest. And I'm, I'm, I'm there. It's patriotism over common sense sometimes. But um, not everybody can do that. And I think putting in some breaks, putting in some uh, secure measures for people, making sure that at least there's a little bit of support, a little bit of helping hands, a little bit of local knowledge available, because that's one thing that we have. We've been, we've been out of room for a while, and things right. have changed. We've left. We are Ghanaian by skin color, but in terms of knowledge for a lot of people, we are not. Mentality has shifted that much. So that really right. great process requires thought. And definitely, it would be one I would love to see on your manifestos uh, highlighted because there is a huge potential. It would only be harnessed when some of these guarantees are put in place for people. Very important. I, I, assure, I assure you that you will see um, much more than just something on my manifesto where that is concerned. Um, okay. I, I, am, I am even more certain that just seeing the entirety of the manifesto will give people a lot of hope that this country is about to take a totally different shape and form if we all support it to make it happen. I, I, I think it's about time. Um, I think there is no other better time than now to make that happen. And, and, I, and I, I am totally committed to making that happen. I just need all of your support, um, everybody else listening support. Um, at the end of the day, it's about all of us. We all need to, we all want this to be a, a country we can all be proud of, um, a country we can all call home. And we have the best of both worlds. You know, it, it would be great for those here to know that, look, they can go on holiday in another country, but they have a country they're proud of to still go back to. Um, uh, unlike currently what it is, if people go on holidays, they see what is elsewhere and they're like, you know what, I don't want to go back. Um, you know, no, but it's true. I mean, I, I, in the early stage of my, myself in the UK, I had colleagues who came from Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and some of them, well, not Sri Lanka, Malaysia, um, um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, and all those other, uh, Eastern Asian countries, um, around there. And they were more than happy to pack bag and bag and go back home after the education because they knew that they had a lot more on offer there and that's what i think we should be doing as well it's you see we don't value competency and knowledge we value political activism and political noise and so the more noise you can make politically the more you rise when that changes to meritocracy where we value people who have um, something they can add to move everybody else forward. You you will soon start realizing that those who have the knowledge and uh, the capital they can apply to increasing the value of this country will start coming back home because their, their value is starting to be appreciated. And for me, that is why I say I can never compromise on uh, on uh, meritocracy. If, if you're fit for the job, you're fit for the job, pure and simple. I don't care whether you're NDC or MPP. I would happily walk to the camp of the NDC and say, look, this is your best man in this country for this particular role. We need him. It's up to him to say, I am, I am patriotic enough to come on board or to say, you know what, I don't want to know anything about you because you've, been, you've politically removed my people out of office, but I will make that move. So for me, it is not about individuals, it's not about parties, it's about this country. And, 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 and here's what I've always said is that I think we need to start getting a lot more nationally greedy than individually greedy. You Ooh, know, uh, loud, sorry? Loud. Louder, please. I like that. 
<laughs> no, I'm just saying that I think we need to be nationally greedy than individually greedy. And I think that's what will make us move forward. Uh, I've lived in a few countries and they would go after any opportunity as long as it is their country that gets that opportunity. And once they get that opportunity, everybody else can plug into it. That's progressive. Yeah. That's how you progress. You go out there and you hunt for what to push the entire country forward. And once you get it, everybody has a, a, a part in it. But this thing where a few people want to hijack everybody because they feel that everybody else has to go down for them to rise up, that's not how we build nations. I have two big ones, and I'm going to put them forward so I don't forget either. Marie has one. Uh, she says, what would you do as president? To repay our debt to China, you knew that was coming right. The debt to China, and also what would the relationship with them be like moving forward in light of what we've seen recently? So that's the first half. And the second half is also quite popular. I've seen it a few times. People want to know about ex Russia awards. They want to know about the government <laughs> They want to know what practical things you're doing in fighting this corruption. So I want to both allow to answer them individually so I do <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't even know which one to answer first, but I'll just jump in and out of it. Um, so the question about our debt to China, I don't think China is the only country we have debts to. I think we have quite a number of debts we've taken out of uh uh through our bonds and all that most of them are long-term bonds now um from what i'm gathering um and so over time i mean a few of them have just become due and we've taken other you know bonds to sort of repay the old bonds and we're just recycling bonds uh, all over the place um but i i think there's a few critical things we need to be doing um one of them largely is that we and I can't repeat this enough, there's a huge amount of money that we need to be saving from efficiencies across board. Um, and that includes how remunerations to uh, the public sector, even the number of people within the public sector, what we spend on, are we spending on more vehicles than we are spending on repaying our debt? Um, are we spending on luxury uh, accommodation when our ministers travel or not? By the way, uh, none of my ministers is going to have more than, uh, you, know, you don't need five cars, you don't need four cars to run as a minister. Nobody needs that. Not in any country. Not in any country, at least that I have been to. So for me, all that, all that, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to be very, for life, but all that would have to stop at some point. Um, <laughs> all that would have to stop. So there is quite a lot of money that can even be saved just by becoming more efficient in the way we do things. Um, that's, that's one. Um, the other thing is to be able to learn to say to Ghanaians, look, for the next four or five years, we're going to have to live within our means. It means that we won't be flamboyant. No, we have to do this. President Kufo did that some time back. Um, yeah. And I value that aspect of his, of his, of his tenor. We yeah. have to be blunt, honest about certain things. We have to be honest about what we can and what we cannot do. We have to ask questions about this is how everybody is doing it and spending money. Do we also have to do it that way? Can we do it a better way? So there are several things that are cross board we need to get doing. Um, we are always um, backlogged in our, our projections of taxation and how much we actually collect. Um, in fact, I always throw a question and say, look, forget about even taxation. We borrow about three billion every year to spend on buying cocoa. We buy the cocoa, we sell the cocoa, we get paid for the cocoa. And yet for the last 27 plus years, we have still been borrowing three billion. Are we trying to say, for example, that for the last 27 years, we've been borrowing cocoa. When we sell the cocoa, do we just sell them at cost price? I mean, surely we have been making some money on cocoa. 
So where has all the money been going that for the last 27 plus years, we have had to be borrowing this amount of money every, every year to buy our own cocoa before we export them? What where the money goes? As <laughs> <laughs> I could I could hazard a few guesses for sure. And uh, the ex Russia, please visit that. I know Marie is um, not particularly specific, but I am I Marie hold off fire a little bit. Let him touch on the ex Russia <laughs> for me. Um the ex Russia the I, I don't believe, I mean, as Russia by its very definition is, is benefits you, that is awarded you, it's not even something you take, you're not entitled to it, it's what is awarded you, um, uh, prerogatively, um, when you are finally leaving office. Um, unfortunately, we have a system where as Russia is taking every four years, whether you return back to office or not by parliamentarians, I think it is wrong, I think it's disgraceful, um, and I think we need to start holding our MPs accountable to this country for, for having indulged in that and still call themselves patriotic. These are things we need to question. I have certainly questioned them, and these are things we need to stop. Um, like I always say, these are things that have been established um, uh, through certain means, and so it will take the same means to go back and reverse them but i pledge my commitment that i am not a fan of uh, people taking as gracia every four years even if they remain uh, continually in office um sorry have i answered that all the questions or because i'm um, I'm not sure. I think there were three questions. Uh, I'm not sure if I've answered all three. I think I may have answered two. I'm not sure which one I did not answer. So I've answered the question on the uh, uh, the borrowing, and I have said it's not only China that we owe. We owe an awful lot of, uh, well, not an awful lot, but we, we owe different uh, countries and different uh, uh, individuals or organizations. Uh, so not only China. Um, uh, from what I have been made to understand, quite a bit of China's debt to to uh, with us has been locked in into uh, some of our petroleum, not all of it, but some of our petroleum. Um, unfortunately, Ama, as I speak to you, I I would have to see some of the details of those contracts. Obviously, people like you and I cannot see those things until we get there. Um, and it requires that we are able to see some of these details and then be able to determine, okay, this is the way we can go about them or not. So forgive me that I may not be able to answer all those questions to the granular level you want them to be, but the reality is that until we see some of the reality um, of those contracts, um, uh, even contracts with the, uh, the, the the energy companies who are supplying us power and we are not using them. We, you know, until we see those on the surface, we know the uh, agreements that require that we pay, even though we are not consuming power or not. But it also requires that we see the granular details of those contracts to be able to even determine if we can maneuver or if there is a different way to maneuver around them. We certainly have some thoughts around how to maneuver some of these, but until you actually see the contracts and um, the, the granular details in them, you know, um, you and I know that the, the devil is always in the detail. Unless you, until you can see the devil face to face, you don't know whether to use uh, holy water or the holy sword or whatever it is you need to use. <laughs> but you told me that you had China figured out and you would do X, Y, Z. And I thank you very much. That any of you out own a lot of pieces here. Yeah, we have to know. At the moment, from where you are, you would not know. That's the reality. And I appreciate that. I think sometimes we need to be aware of the realities. We need to accept them. Yeah, it would be nice if we had situations to go. I want to know, certainly. I do know that he can't have that information at the moment. And sometimes we just have to live with the reality as they are. All right. So let's. There was a question on corruption. Oh, um, yes, sir. Yeah, please. There was a question on corruption. So. Um, that's an interesting question, and I don't think we are going to be able to deal with corruption from just one route. Uh, sometimes people ask you the question about corruption, but the expectation is that 
you give one answer. There is no one answer to dealing with corruption. That's a fact. Um, there are several approaches we want to deal with corruption. I'll just mention three um, for, for the purposes of time. Uh, one of them and the most simplest, but the most difficult of them is enforcement of law and order. Um, fortunately, I am not, uh, I am very, in fact, I have been called even headmaster in my time. I believe in enforcement. Um, I, sorry, Alma, but it's the truth. Um, you can choose not to like me for now, but <laughs> but I, I, I strongly believe, I think it's the auditing part of me. I believe in finding out what has happened and and figuring out who needs to take the hit for it. I, I, I'm struggling into that. So I believe in enforcement and one that is one thing I would make sure uh, eternally happens. Um, so that's one key area that is, is something we cannot toy with. Um, if we can get enforcement going on at the very highest level, even at the presidency, and I always say that I have a zero tolerance for corruption, but it's not enough to just say you have a zero tolerance for corruption. So I, I am saying to Ghanaians far and near that, you know what, um, I, can, I can pledge right now that you should see the highest level of enforcement of the rules and the laws of this country without fear and favor. Because at the end of the day, in my, in my tenor, because at the end of the day, here's the thing. I don't have a party chairman to tell me that if I don't forgive this person next year, they are not going to help me win votes. The votes are from the Ghanaian people. That's the other beautiful thing about independent candidacy that we don't see. It's that it gives you the freedom and the political will to do things that parties normally could not and cannot do. Um, so that is with enforcement. The other big area that I, my team and I believe that will be used to deal with corruption is affordable housing. And usually when I say this, people ask, what has affordable housing got to do with corruption? But here's it, let me break it down. Property is the highest social value in our society. Yeah. You can work for as many years, you can do as many great things. If you don't have a property, your value to yourself and to society is, is zilch. Here is what tends to happen. For corruption to happen, most people need a motivation. They need an opportunity and they need, they need, they need a motivation to, uh, to, walk, to walk on. Ama, if you are getting close to the age of 50 or 55, and you know that you have just five years to go on retirement, and based on the salary you are getting, you know you can never build a house in five years. But you also know that if you go on pension without a house, you are doomed. You have the highest motivation within those five years to do the most dangerous of things within those five years, to get a property within those five years. If we can get to a situation where a young person goes into employment and he knows that within the next 15, 20, 25 years, if I push myself, I can get, even if it is a one bedroom house, I can get it and call it my own. I'm a, there will be a, a huge drop in the number of motivations to do corrupt things. So that is, a, and, and this is not about just, so I'm not looking at affordable housing purely from a social, uh, responsibility point of view. I'm also looking at it from the viewpoint that internally and inherently as a society, it forms a basis that draws a lot on the motivation why people get corrupt. Because at the end of the day, people just want to hold on to at least one piece of land or at least one hole in chamber. You know, because it is terrible, Amma, that you go on pension and you don't have a place to lay your head. As we sit in this country, as, and this is a statistics that will shock a lot of people. Our, our life expectancy is about, what, 64, which means that if you go on pension at 60 years, averagely, I'm not saying everybody would die at 64, but averagely you have about just four years to live. Now, couple that with the pressure that you go on pension and realize that you are out in the sun. 
You don't have your own place to lay your head. That is a terrible situation to put any population. So for me, uh, what we call actual affordable housing is a priority amongst a lot of other priorities. It is one of the top priorities we have. And we're not talking about just for inf uh, sorry, uh, 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 affordable accommodation in the, in the cities, because look, there are also people in our rural areas. And what I want to do is to be able to mix affordable housing with agriculture. And we have a very interesting way we're gonna do that. Um, so that it also acts as a motivation for people to go into the areas of the economy that we, we have the greatest value coming from. So let me not bore you with that, but that's the second thing. The third thing we want to do is to... Uh... You can bore me any time <laughs> I want to be I am quiet and I'm soaking because once I've heard you, then I will drill and I'll ask deeper questions. <laughs> right, I don't want right. to raise also the team list. So people have raised the Freedom of Information Bill, and they wonder if that's not making um, details of the contracts with China, the debt contracts, available. Sorry, you're you breaking. You, you, oh. you're, you're, yeah. Can you Has repeat that? Yeah. So people want to know if you've made any requests under the Freedom of Information Bill for details about the contracts. Have you actually made the attempt? to access the information? It, I mean, what it depends on what people mean by contract. I mean, what contract are they referring to? I mean, them, there's hundreds of thousands of contracts that this country has signed. Um, um, I am lucky to have seen some of them. Um, some of them I have not seen. I wouldn't claim to have seen all of them. So it really depends on what contract people are referring to. And if they, if they could be a bit more specific, um, there are there are hundreds of uh, there are thousands thousands of contracts that this country has signed. Uh, some of them uh, that happen on an everyday basis. I mean, there are contracts for procurement, contracts for uh, 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 how do we call them? Sorry, my I'm um, I'm I'm losing track of my the words I want to use. But the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that there are several contracts. So until we are certain about which particular contract it is, it's, it's quite difficult to... Uh, China uh, interest. I've got to tell you. It's the China well, interest. It well, is, I think it's, there, was a, there, was a big, there was a big contract which was supposed to take 100 years uh, uh, funding um, or 100 years uh, spread of the fund uh, for over something billion towards the bauxite agenda. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, that has not materialized. Um, and so if that is what people are talking about, because that is the biggest, uh, supposedly yeah. biggest contract that we would have had with China. Um, but it, I, to the best of my knowledge, that has not crystallized, if, if I can put it that way. So if that is, the, that, is, that is the key one people are referring to, and that is the biggest one I know of. Um, that that has not really, um, you know, uh, how do I put it, uh, crystallized to the best of my knowledge. So unless there's some other contracts out there that people are concerned about, I think one of the things we need to know about China, and, 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 and I don't want to say just China, just Asia in general, is that we need to, and this, this takes a huge level of uh, pragmatism, we need to accept that Asia is where the world has, um, what, what we call the pinnacle of the world has moved to. We need to accept that. It, it will be living in denial, not accepting that the, the center of the world is now in Asia. It will be a denial not to accept that. What I think we should be focusing on in dealing with the Asian countries is to the best of our abilities, try to be able to secure access to knowledge and technologies from these places. Because technologies have become cheap in those places, those are the technologies we need to evolve and to be able to grow ourselves uh, uh, organically. And so I think the focus on China should not be to be listening to what Western media is saying by saying China is all evil. The reality is that they have achieved something within the shortest possible time that other, other jurisdictions have not been able to achieve. It needs a recognition of that. It does not mean you need to sell yourself to China as a country, 
but it also means that you need to understand China. China goes into countries to do business. Everything China does for itself is purely business. So if you are sitting at the table with China and you are not very cautious of the terms within the terms, the, the contracts that you are signing with China, and you simply think that China is like every other uh, development partner, that is on to you. We, it's, it's our responsibility to go into any engagement with China knowing exactly what we want out of that process. It's one thing to go in to go and get a loan. It's another thing to go in to have some technical cooperation with the likes of Japan and all that who are also in, the, uh, in, 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 in Asia. So it, it, I don't think we ought to be overly fixated by, about China. China is not taking guns and going into countries and shooting people and taking over their assets. China is in the business of doing business strictly. It is up to us to also wise up when we do decide to go to the table with these guys to determine whether or not we have what it takes to even sit at the table and we have what it takes to determine what it is we want before we even go to that table. It, it, this is not about China, I want to say. If we as a country will go to any country not even being clear in our minds what we want out of that engagement, any country will have the capacity to bully us into selling us off to them. Hasn't and that, that also with education? I mean, I always drill it back here. I think some of the technocrats we we sent to negotiate is bully because they are self knowledgeable of how uh, international discourse happens. So people, we've sent people to the slaughterhouses. They've taken any body giving it seems a wonderful deal because of ignorance i don't think it's all driven by malice i think a lot of the useless contracts we've seen comes from ignorance and people greed. are wearing well greed to an extent but i think a lot of it is actually ignorance i and actually know from, you should see some of, of the, you should see some of the contracts we sign with the energy um energy right. suppliers you know that that People just took advantage of a position we were in as a country and decided to do some crazy things. $3,000. I've seen some. $3,000. And we could have contributed to pay them if only they would have told us. If, if all they wanted was $3,000, we could have fund, uh, crowdfunded for them. They could have had $10,000 and made a more reason. <laughs> there is, I think that's some. When we send people to negative contracts, I will happily crowdfund for them $10,000 so that they can at least attempt to make a reasonable offer, not looking at uh, what goes in their pocket. But I've also seen instances, Marek, where people have actually gone to the negotiating table and they haven't got the foggiest what an APR is. I've seen a scenario of somebody. I'm <laughs> joking. Oh, God. Yeah. And uh, I know. Doesn't know what the PR is, but was on the negotiating team. And had to go ask what that meant in the middle of negotiation. And it's shooting ourselves in the foot that way, which has got us where we are predominantly. predominantly. But Amma, you will be surprised that there are many Ghanaians around who could have gotten the job done. Absolutely. The only reason why they are not at the table is that they are not the ones who make the most noise. And I think that's one of the critical things that, one of the things I said earlier was, I, uh, one of my priorities is institutional reforms. That's one of the key things I wanna change is that we bring the best into even the public sector. The public sector in every country is beginning to take on the shape of industry. They are beginning to mirror industry, to think like industry. Uh, to be profit oriented, even though we look at it in value terms, you know, but the mentality is is the same. Um, and if we can begin to bring the best we have in, because you see, at the end of the day, the public sector is the one sector that affects everybody else in the country. And it it it, it it's it's not rocket science to say that we therefore need the best to be in there so that we can make the best decisions to suit you know everybody else um but if we're not doing that then um, um and if all we are doing is that okay this is the person who made the most noise 
Oh, when I on your vote, say, 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 am I from this constituency? Therefore, your man opposed we. You know, we, 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 we're not going to get anywhere with that. Well, it hasn't um, helped that change, but it, it takes some commitment. I've been to places in Ghana and I've said to people, I am actually, I mean, EdTech, for example, God willing, in 2021, I will be the world's number five expert in it because that's my book, which said. I am actually researching that area. But I've been to a few places and I've said to people, this is me. I'm consulting in other places. I'm willing to do it for free. Ask me if anybody's going me on. So if people make offers and they are not accepted, people move on. Because I mean, for how long would you be asking? For how long would you be knocking on doors um, and not really getting anywhere? It's an enabling environment and it has to be holistic. It has to be yeah. holistic. People really do need to see that when they present whatever to a team, it will be taken, people will grab you, people will utilize it without necessarily looking at the results. It will change a lot of things. I'm excited. Right. I know, bless us, Marek is not funny. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry, what was that? She, she says it's not funny. I mean, the China uh, scenario with the sale of the birthrights and uh, well, China I, I, I think. I, I I I know it's not funny, uh, and I haven't tried to make it funny. But I I think we I think we there's there's different angles to this China debacle, um, and it's understanding how the world works. You see, because on the one hand, the whole world knows now that you cannot do business without at any point in time crossing paths with China. It's impossible. Yeah. That's a reality we have to face with. So when people say, let's totally cut out um, China out of everything we do, um, it, it borders down on not being real. You know, in the sense that there are several, you see, just the way China sits back and plants itself and says, okay, this is this country, this is what they have, this is what we need, this is how we have to approach it to determine how we get what we need without them getting too much from us in return. Nothing stops us from also sitting at the table and crafting our strategy as such. Absolutely. And saying, this is what we want from China, okay, we have the money to pay for all of it, so we don't need them on our side. Let's just go get the technology or get the expertise or get whatever they are selling that we need uh, to push our agenda forward. Let's get it. If they don't have anything we want, let's move away to the next person who does. Um, no, Nobody, China does not force anybody to come to China. Uh, it's we who go to China. You know, that's the reality. So we've... Willingly, willingly. You've got to be very automatic about this, that it is we who want, who need to do the thinking and decide what do we want? What is the best way to get it? And who is the best person to get it from? So that if you add the sum total of all of that, it is for our greater good and not for our greater disservice. Uh, it's, okay. it's all about, it's all about, uh, it's all about strategy and positioning and knowing what is out there and what is available and what, what you don't have. And, you know, until we can think that way, we would always be shouting that, you know, people who actually can contribute to our moving forward are, are demons and all that. They are not. Um, but you need to understand how the world works, really. Okay. So that's a lesson diplomacy, isn't it? Kwame is back and he says um, it's called national agenda. We don't have it. So we can't blame China or who take advantage of us. I think that's straight down. It, it, it's well, straight. you know, to be honest, I, I like what Kwame has said, but let me just say that we can have a national agenda, for example, to build uh, a, an 800 kilometer road. Okay. That is in the national agenda. We have agreed we want to do it. 
if we still end up giving the contract to the Chinese, it wouldn't have mattered whether it was even a national agenda or not. See what I mean, Ama? So it's a it's a it's a conscious decision we have to make to say, you know what, for whatever we want to do, whether it's in the national agenda or not. There is a specific strategic way we want to go about it. And the bottom line is that Ghana should win out of that process. Okay. Right. So bottoms up approach, isn't it? Marie has put one more up. She says, so in thinking what's your plan this far, she wants to know your personal strategy. My personal strategy in relation to what exactly, please? Marie, can you clarify, please? What exactly are you referencing so Marie can answer it for you? I mean, I've, we've been talking for close to two hours. I don't want to tip too far out. I want people who come to watch this later also to be able to stay. It becomes too long. People don't watch it till the end. People miss important parts. So I'd rather do a few frequent interviews than do a 10-hour because I've got you once. I think we will get we will get more out of that engagement than a long extended one for people zone out of. Now, if in summary, if somebody knew <laughs> has heard of this today, and that person is a little bit skeptical because we've been played games with for quite a while. I would like to give you the next, I don't know, three to five minutes to sum up and explain to us why we should be excited that you've decided to be a candidate. What should make right. us um, <laughs> Let me just say that I, I think we should, these are exciting times. Uh, we should all be excited for a number of reasons. First of all, I want to say quickly that, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to the wonderful people who have interacted so far. I'm, I'm de deeply grateful. Um, a few things. We are not where we're supposed to be. Let no one be fooled. And let no one also be fooled that if we repeat what we've been doing for the last 27 years, it's certainly going to get us to where we're supposed to be. It's not going to get us there. This country has enough to make us all, you know, make the best out of our lives. It's not happening. And that's the reality we have to face. It can happen. But it's not going to happen with the NDC and the NPP. We've seen that for 27 plus years. I don't know how many more we need to, to be certain that it's not happening. So here is what I want to say to people. I've put myself forward. Um, a son of the land. I am very purely Ghanaian. I am doing this because I have a personal interest in this. The personal interest is that you and I have at least another 30 years to live. I don't want it to be like the way the last 27 years have been. And for me, the point is quite simple. If we miss this one last opportunity, it will cost us another 27 years, or it might even cost us another 63 years. So we have this one opportunity to get it right. Um, let's get it right. Let's do it differently. Come vote for me. Vote for any other independent candidate you feel that has what it takes to move this country forward. I have put out myself, I've put out some of my ideas. Um, a lot of things that we are planning to get done is going to come out in manifestos and all that. And so let's look out for these things. Check me out on any of our platforms. We have a platform on, on Facebook. We, um, If you want to join us, by all means, join us. Uh, am, am I allowed to quote a number here? Oh, of course you are. And if you actually right. did give me links, I will publish them for you. So right. without... Yeah, let's go right ahead. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the number, we have a WhatsApp number that is 055, I mean, I'm talking Ghanaian number here. So 055-382-0629. So that's 055-382-0629. Just text, just text the phrase, I love Ghana, and send it via WhatsApp to that number and you'll be able to join us. I love Ghana. Just type, I love Ghana, and send it to that number via WhatsApp, and you should be able to join us. Look, these are exciting times. Um, this is our generation. It'll take us. We are the only remaining bridge 
between the, the dreams of our forefathers that were not fulfilled and a new generation that is even yet unborn. We can't hand over what we have now to the next generation. It, it's, it's not right. Uh, we don't even deserve that in our generation. So look, let's get on board wherever you are. Um, this is exciting times. We can make a difference and we should make a difference. I encourage everybody, go out there, use your influences, influence those you can influence to change the status quo. And let's do this together in December 2020. Uh, God bless you all for being on here. And um, I, I am hopeful that I will see you on the other side of this agenda and that we can all say, you know, what well, we were part of making a new history happen and giving Ghana a new breath of life. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. And also, you know, every time you get something good, you want more. I've actually hinted a few times that I do want you more. And Marie, I think, with this, she says, we probably need you to come back, sir, because so far she to have her vote and we want them all in so oh i just back, i sir. just did um let me just let me just clarify that i want all your votes i want every vote whether you are in the diaspora if you're in the diaspora your vote is even bigger because you can influence those at home if you need to send them dollars or pounds to influence them, do whatever you can. But whatever the situation is, I need your votes both here in Ghana. I need your votes both in the diaspora and everywhere else in the world. So there you go. I've said it in, in black and white. I need every vote I can get from all of you. And use your influence to draw more votes. If you have, if I have your votes, I want those of your family too. Thank you. All right. So uh, Matthew. If you're actually familiar with my format, the very first interview I do with everybody else is in English because I think it needs to be inclusive. Not every Ghanaian speaks the local dialect. I only speak one. I speak the Akan dialect and that's it. If so, we have- Don't worry, we'll have, a, we'll have one in LA. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with my network now, but yeah, <laughs> I, I do the first interview in English because I want it to be accessible. I don't want to exclude anybody. But if Marek were to accept my invitation to come further, we will speak tea because that's all I speak. And if any of you is brave enough to take him on and speak any of the other dialect, as you can see, he's accessible. He's spoken to me. I've made him a that can't afford it. I'm in it. And so if you really did want to engage him and if you went down his channels, he's giving you a contact detail. Get in touch, get in touch with the team. And if you wanted to speak any other languages, I'm very sure that he would gracefully, graciously answer that one too and let you get more people to experience his stuff. So I don't know. Dialect, I can only do one. And nation building is not one person's job. I will do what I can. And if that's not adequate, you step in and you do other language. You can even translate it into a language. All right, thank you so much. It's been a fabulous interview. I, I have you guys. He had to drive from his home because um, electricity was cut, and he had to actually travel to a friend's home to make this happen. And it could easily have been there is no light in the house. I have no Wi-Fi, and I would have understood. And for that, I am very grateful. Thank you so much. Be back, Amma. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Good night. Okay, guys. So there you have it. <laughs> Coley, be careful. Very cool. And the local dialect thing, I know there's a moment for people want it to happen, but we also have to be realistic, okay? Sometimes for certain things, you have to do English because it's our official language and it's the only language most of us actually speak. Very few of us speak the individual dialects. It brings in uh, giving certain tribes um, preferences. It brings in a whole lot of things. And sometimes it's a lot easier just to stay with the unifying language. I just want to move away from it. So energy will be his first task. I don't know, Marie. I am hoping that we will draw uh, Marik back just as we managed to get Kofi to commit to come regularly. I don't think one interview allows you to know the candidate. I don't think you delve deep enough on the first interview. I think he needs to relax to the audience and for the audience also to understand him. 
But definitely, he shared information on where you can reach him. Do engage, do engage. And if anybody else knows, I didn't know that there was more than two independent candidates. That's ridiculous. At this point, a few months, what, seven months before elections, we should really know who is in this running, and we don't. If you know who the other candidates are, if you could even give me names, if you could give me contact details, if you could point me in their campaign team's direction, that would be phenomenal. I would love to engage all of them. Anybody who's willing to speak to me, welcome. So do pass that message on. And if people want to contact me, that would be wonderful. I owe you a lot for staying and for watching and for engaging and for supporting. I am eternally grateful. I don't take that for granted whatsoever. You enable um, what should be a chat between two people to actually become lively. And I hope that you've learned something about our other independent candidates. I hope that I'll be able to bring you more meaningful, um, well, other meaningful, not more, other meaningful interviews and discussions. Do watch the interviews we've had with Kofi Granting as well. This afternoon, I had a conversation with Ernesto Yeboa. He, he throws in another mix, totally, from um, the other side, the activism side of our political divide. And I would like more people to actually understand that side and its purpose. You don't have to belong to a political party all the time to change things. Daniel, uh, Ghanaians will encourage us all to listen to the independent candidates. I'm trying. I'm trying my very best to draw them in. And anybody who is willing to come, definitely, would uh, I would facilitate that and make that happen. And Tia, thank you so much. Thank you. I really am grateful. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, sis. Right, yes, I am still researching. I only knew about these two, and I've, I've gone for them. Now that I know there might be more, I will have a look and see if I might be able to court them, and I might be able to tempt them to also come and have a conversation. I want to understand what's out there. I want to know all our options so that when we do make decisions, we make it on full disclosure. That is what will help us make better choices going forward. Thank you very much. Good night. Really do appreciate you being here. And please, if you shared you, share it. Make watch parties out of it for me. Put it in your social groups for me because I bet you majority of other Ghanaians still don't know who the candidates are. How do we choose when we don't know what the options are? How do we choose? It's insane. So please feel free to tag anybody. Feel free to run your watch parties. Feel free to share it anywhere. What is important to me is that Ghanaians access the information. And if you could help more, come in contact with the message, I will owe you an awful lot. Thank you so much and good night. Yes, Auntie Dako, I'm quoting them. I have been courting them, and I'm hoping to land some more so we can chat to them. Good night, everybody. God bless.